Welcome to the Video Professor series of computer learning tapes, the nation's number one computer trainer. We'll take you step by step through learning to use your computer software. On the screen now are some other tapes available in our series. When using these tapes, we suggest you watch them in their entirety. Then go back with your computer and practice each step. In keeping with the video professor's dedication to giving you the best lesson possible, we have packed these tapes with information and sometimes move at a pace that is faster than you will be able to follow along with as you are working with your computer. Remember, you can always pause or rewind the tape to learn each part. Now let's get started. The Internet, the Information Highway, the New Electronic Frontier, the World Wide Web. These phrases and concepts have become a part of everyday language, yet many of us still don't really know what these terms mean. In this lesson, we will not only introduce you to the basic concepts of these high-tech buzzwords, but by following along with our easy-to-understand instructions, we'll have you on the Internet, actually driving on the information highway and experiencing for yourself what these advances in communications and computer technologies hold in store for you. In this lesson, we will cover the system requirements needed to get you on the Internet, how to set up a connection with a service provider, what service providers are and what they offer. We'll see how to use electronic mail transfer or email and how to browse the World Wide Web, where you will discover many places you can go for finding interesting subjects. Before going further, I'd like to introduce my assistant, Suzanne. Viewers, normally I set up our lessons so you can follow along step by step as I guide Suzanne through the program. We will still do that, but the program we will be using, America Online, may not be on everyone's computer. PC Magazine ranks AOL as their editor's choice for providers, saying AOL's easy to use graphical interface, wide choice of content, and full easy internet access has proven enticing to both professionals and hobbyists. It is because of this and the fact that America Online is the largest service provider that we chose to use them to demonstrate this lesson. We'll also be using Windows 95. If you don't have Windows 95 on your computer or prefer using another provider service, you will still be able to understand how these programs work and follow along. All Internet providers work pretty much the same, and once on the Internet, all the basic information is the same. So after you see how the features of these programs work, you'll be ready to cruise the Internet no matter what program you use. I'll go into more detail about this later. I'm going to assume that each of you are familiar with the basics of computer operation and working within the Windows 95 environment. If you are new to Windows, you may want to see my tapes on learning Windows and Windows 95 first. Professor, what exactly is the Internet? Suzanne, that's a perfect place to start. What exactly is the Internet? Best defined, the Internet is a system of interconnected computers. Some of these computers are single, standalone units. Some are entire networks comprised of multiple computers, like you might find on a college campus. But what makes up the Internet is that these computers are linked together by communication paths and are all in agreement to use the same communication language. The Internet is estimated to connect some hundreds of thousands of computers and computer networks and link together 30 to 40 million individual users. If you think that these numbers sound imprecise, it's because the Internet is growing so fast and is so loosely organized that no one really knows exactly how many computers or users there really are. What's most important about this huge network is what it does. When our computer terminals are connected to the Internet, we can view information that resides in our own cities or in another state or in another country halfway around the world. The Internet is not owned or controlled by anyone. In fact, it was designed by the government in the Cold War era to keep communication paths open in case of a nuclear attack. With so many paths open, like an international telephone system, the information could flow freely even if many locations were destroyed. The beauty of the Internet is that we don't have to know about how it works. We can just accept the fact that it does work smoothly, easily, and seamlessly on a worldwide basis. Suzanne, let's start by listing the things we need in order to gain access to the Internet. The computer is the first item on the list. Your computer must have a modem that is connected to a telephone line. You'll also need data communication software and a provider to gain access to the Internet. For those of you who may not have these items yet, or may be looking to upgrade your computer, let's take a quick look at the details of each item. It's important to understand what they are and how they work. The first item on our list is a computer. I should mention here that there are Internet access tools for DOS-only PCs, Macintoshes, OS2s, and just about every other type of operating system in use today. 
We will be referring to Windows-based PCs in this lesson. Your computer should have a 386, 486, or a Pentium microprocessor. You will need at least 4 megabytes of random access memory, better known as RAM. 8 megs of RAM is better, and 16 megs is better yet for some of the larger graphic programs you'll find. Your hard drive will need at least 3 to 5 megabytes of free space, but it is recommended to have at least 15 megabytes available for AOL's new 3.0 version to run smoothly. Some programs like Microsoft Network recommend as much as 30 megs of free hard disk space. You will also need a mouse, a keyboard, and a monitor with VGA or higher capabilities. The system needs to be running DOS 3.1 or higher and Windows 3.1 or higher. A printer and a Windows compatible sound card are optional but very useful. A modem allows the computer to translate its data into a signal that can travel over a standard telephone line to talk to another computer. You will need a Hayes compatible modem that runs at least 9600 bits per second or a 9600 baud modem. The modem can be internal or external. The type of modem as well as the modem speed are considerations that you should talk to your computer dealer about. The faster the modem is able to transfer data, the faster the internet information will appear. Again, this also depends on the amount of RAM you have. It's recommended to have at least a 14.4 baud modem. A 28.8 baud is twice as fast and a good thing to have when exploring some of the graphic oriented programs you find on the internet. There are even faster modems being sold now, so check with your dealer. Remember, speed is time on the computer. The faster you can get information, the less time you'll spend waiting for it, and the less connect time you'll pay for. Our next item is a telephone line. This will give us the communication path into an internet access point. Suzanne is using a standard analog telephone voice line. If you happen to have any telephone extensions in the house, make sure nobody picks up another receiver while our computer is using it, or your connection will be seriously disrupted. Communication software is the next requirement. This software activates the modem and it's often supplied along with it. The Windows program has its own communication program and some internet service providers have their own communication software. Which brings us to providers. There are several ways to access the internet and the easiest is to use one of the most popular providers such as AOL, Prodigy, CompuServe or Microsoft Network. These programs are geared to provide very user-friendly point-and-click systems for you to access the internet as well as many other areas of interest in that particular program. You may want to do some research into what they have to offer to suit your needs. Each of these providers have their own format, which includes many services and activities, as well as access to the Internet. Later in this lesson, I will show you information as to cost and the various services of these providers, plus their phone numbers, so you can decide which is best for you. But for now, let me explain a little bit about what these providers offer. We'll go into more detail with some of these areas when we get online. Each of these providers allow you to have an email address all your own so you can write and receive mail on your computer. They have bulletin boards where you can post and read notes on a variety of subjects. They have chat groups on many subjects that allow you to actively communicate with others who may or may not share your view. They have programs to limit internet access to your children. They have their own shopping areas. They have information on the latest and most interesting news stories. They have interviews and discussion groups with celebrities and people in the know, dealing with every subject you can think of, and programs to help you gain access to the Internet and World Wide Web. Although these providers offer the same kind of features, they are exclusive to each provider, like a city that has two newspapers where the section headings are the same but the content is different. These providers offer the same kind of features but differ as to their content, meaning AOL's chat group will not be the same as Prodigy's. Where they are similar is when you leave their site and enter the world of the Internet, which again is accessible through all of these providers. Some other providers offer plain vanilla access directly to the Internet. These providers don't offer many other programs or services other than access to the Internet. They also offer little or no instruction on how to use the Internet resources. We'll also look at some of these services later in this lesson. There are other ways to get to the Internet using free net programs, but we won't be looking at them in this lesson. Again, we are going to use AOL as our provider. Look at some of the features of that program and then explore the World Wide Web. Remember, if you have or want another provider, they all work pretty much the same and offer the same kinds of programs so you can still learn what these programs do and how they work just by observing our journey into cyberspace. After deciding on your provider, the first thing you need to do is establish an account with them so you can use their services. Establishing an account is a cookie cutter approach of fill in the blanks and is the same procedure for all providers. We'll run through this quickly.
If your modem uses another program, for instance, a fax program, you should exit that application before starting this setup process. If you have a floppy disk of the provider you want, simply put it in your floppy drive, select Run from the Start menu, and type in the installation command. This is usually a setup command located right on the disk. The installation process will begin. To register, you'll be asked for all your personal information like name and address. You'll be asked to enter the phone numbers that best fit your location for the number to call in to the provider. This is a choose from the list type of option. You may need to provide what type of modem you have, how fast it is, and what COM port it is connected to, so be prepared with that information. Finally, you'll be asked to give a credit card number to pay for your account and be asked to enter your screen name and or password, which is usually supplied with the software. Most providers allow you to change this to something more suitable to your liking after signing on. After all that's done, you can sign on to the service and start your journey into cyberspace. Well, here we are. We've successfully made the connection with AOL. Understand we're not quite on the Internet yet. This is the provider's program that also has lots of places to go and things to do. Let's take a quick tour of some of these features. Viewers, remember if you have another provider, they probably have the same sort of features in their program and clearly marked as to how to access them. If you've just installed your program, you may have some automatic updates loaded onto your computer when the welcome screen appears or at other times during an online session. This process keeps your software up to date with the latest upgrades. Also, the opening screens are always being changed with new things. Since this is constantly happening with online services, your screen will look different from Suzanne's. We're looking at the AOL's welcome screen right now. Viewers, don't worry if your screen looks a little different than ours. It changes quite often to display up-to-date topics. These topics can be accessed by clicking on their icons. This screen also lets you know if you have received any mail. Suzanne, click on the button marked Channels. Now we have a screen displaying all the general topic areas you have access to. This screen, as well as most of the screens you'll see, has all the familiar Windows features. Click once on the file menu item, and then press your right arrow a few times and you see many of the commands available to you. Now, Suzanne, click anywhere outside the drop-down menu and slowly move your pointer across the icons on the menu bar and notice you'll get a message about what these icons do. As with any Windows program, you have several ways to accomplish the same task. Probably the easiest way to access different locations is through using the topic buttons on the main menu screen. As you can see, there are several places to visit right here in America Online. Let's quickly see how to navigate through this system. Suzanne, click on Personal Finance. This leads us to a screen with more choices. Let's choose Stocks and Investing by double-clicking on those words. Now we have more choices. On the right are several choices for reading what some stock analysts have to say about the market. Click the Quotes and Portfolios. Now we are given a screen where we can actually find what stocks are trading for and create a portfolio for your investments. Type in IBM, the stock symbol for IBM, in the Quote box. Click on the Quotes button and we get what shares of IBM are selling for at this time whether it's up or down, and a history of its highs and lows. We are not actually on the Internet here, but choosing subjects that take you deeper into more specific areas is similar to what we will experience once we get on the Internet. Click on this Windows Close button to move back one level and keep closing Windows until we are back to the Channels window. Again, viewers, other providers offer similar topics that come with their program. All these topics are easy to access. And I'm sure you'll want to come back and explore them on your own. But for now, let's move on to sending and receiving email. Email stands for electronic mail and is a way for you to send letters as well as computer files to other computers that are hooked up to the Internet and or a provider service. Click the Welcome button on the bottom of the screen. And we now see our icon for mail. If you have new mail, this button would say, you have mail. We don't seem to have any, but click on this icon anyway to open AOL's mail messaging system. 
viewers, you may get a download here if you've just set up a new account. On the upper right of this screen, you have several menu choices. These choices will change often for current affairs. Under other things you can do are several choices you can check out by double clicking on these words. Click on online newsletters. Now click on about online newsletters. Here you can read what these services are all about. Close these windows back to our mail screen. Click on Message Exchange. And on the next screen, click on List Categories. Now we are given three categories to check out. Click on List Topics. Notice on top of this window, we are given topics with 3,368 documents created. Let's read all of them. Just kidding. But I did want to point out there is a lot of information for you to read about email if you want it. Click on Unwanted Mail, and you get many ways to read and reply to email problems you might encounter. This is an area you may want to come back and check out so you don't fall into pitfalls many others have experienced. One note here, be careful who you send your email address to, as you could start getting junk mail just like you do through your regular mail. Okay, close all of these windows back to our Mail Center screen. Suzanne, click on the Mail pull-down menu. Here are more choices for things to do with your email. From this list, you can open the Mail Center, check new mail, or read mail you've already read or already sent. Suzanne, click on the Edit Address Book option. We'll check out some of the other options in a minute. Since we haven't entered any addresses in our address book yet, this box is empty. Let's enter one now. Suzanne, click on the Create button. The address book screen is ready for us to enter our first address. Viewers, to demonstrate sending mail and using your address book, we are going to send a letter to Santa. You can join us and make your next Christmas wish list or send mail to an address you know that's more practical. Santa has his email address set up to use his own name as the computer name. There are two areas to enter information in your address book. The top box wants to know how you associate with the addressee. For example, a person's real name, mom, dad, a corporate name. We'll enter Santa Claus. With the cursor flashing in that box, type that in. Press your tab key and the cursor is now flashing in the address box. Type Santa, the at sign, that's shift to, santaclaus.com. An email address cannot contain any spaces, so make sure there aren't any. With that done, click OK and OK again. Now click on the Compose button on the main menu screen. Here is where we address, write, and send our mail. Electronic mail is very similar to regular post office mail except that it's faster since it travels through computer and telephone line connections. We can build on our understanding of a regular letter to see how email works. In regular mail, you write the address on the envelope using the person's name, street address, city, state, and zip. An email address follows a pattern just like a postal address. It includes the address information needed to route a message from your computer along the phone connections to someone else's computer. In the two box is where we put the address of our destination. You can simply type the address in this box, but since we've set up Santa's address in our address book, let's see how to retrieve it. In the lower left corner of this window is the address book icon. Click on it. A list of our addresses appears. We only have the one now, but you can imagine how it could fill up quickly. Make sure Santa is highlighted and click on the To button. Our address is automatically entered into our To box. Click OK to close the address book and click in the CC box. In the CC box, you can enter another address you want your mail to be sent as a courtesy copy. You can enter your own address to send a copy of this mail to yourself. Let's do that to keep a copy of this letter. Viewers, your computer name on AOL is the ID you use to sign on. The at sign followed by AOL.com. Again, no spaces. 
Each provider has their own extension, so be sure if you are using another provider to use that extension. For example, Prodigy uses your username at sign prodigy.com. So your email address has three parts. Let's put them together. First, type your account ID, the letters and numbers you use to sign on. Suzanne, do you remember ours? That's right, V Professor. Then an at sign. And finally, the name of the service location, which is AOL.com. That's it, Suzanne, our very own email address. Suzanne, we have the addresses entered, so press your tab key this time to go to the next section, Subject. This is the space where you can give a short title to your message. When email shows up in your mailbox, you'll see who it's from and the title they've given it. When you start getting lots of messages, this helps sort through the stack of mail. So when you send a message to someone else, the subject title helps them sort it out as well. You can use any kind of title you'd like. Let's call this message a new modem. Type that title into the subject box, Suzanne. And tab to the next area. We're finally ready to type the message to Santa Claus. Email messages can be as large as 24K, but we'll keep this one short and to the point. Viewers, type in your own wish list if you'd like. You never know what Cyber Santa might do. Suzanne, type Dear Santa. I've been really good so far this year. And I'd really like to get a new modem for my computer. Thanks. See you at Christmas. There's your letter to Santa, Suzanne. Professor, I didn't sign it. How will he know who it's from? You're right, Suzanne. It's a courtesy to add a sign-off. Many folks add quotes and other taglines to their email messages as well. But even if you didn't, your computer name would be automatically added to the message and displayed in your receiver's incoming mailbox along with the subject line. Go ahead and type your name at the bottom, Suzanne. This is a good place to use your real name instead of your email name. Suzanne, highlight your name by dragging your mouse cursor over it like you would do in any word processor. Notice we have a few formatting icons at the top of this box. Click the B for boldface and your name is now boldfaced. Notice you can change the color of the text, font size, boldface, underline, italicize, and change the alignment of text to left, center, or right justify. That's it, Suzanne. Your email is ready to go. All you need to do to send it is click send. But don't do that just yet. I want to show you one other feature of the email program. See the icon marked Attach? Click on it, Suzanne. Email is not only a good, fast, and inexpensive way to write letters, it can also be used to send computer files. You could use this file dialog box to select the file you want to send. Then when you send your mail, the file would go with it. When your mail is received, the new mail window will show you an icon that signifies that the email has an attached file. The name of the attached file, its size, and the amount of time it will take to download will be indicated. There are buttons on the bottom that give you the option of downloading now or later. I won't go into detail with attaching files in this lesson, but we'll show you where to go to find more information about it. But first, let's send our mail to Santa, so cancel out of this dialog box. Now all you need to do is click on the Send button. You are prompted that it has indeed been sent, so click OK. Professor, since I'm in AOL, if I send a letter to someone with a different provider, will they get it? Yes, they would, Suzanne. Since your mail does travel over the Internet, it can go to all the other online services. I want to cover a few more things about your email service before we move on. Close this window. To find out more about attaching files, click on Basic Email Help. Now click on how do I download an attached file. From here you can read about the do's and don'ts about this subject. Click the close button. You can also read about other internet mail services here and how AOL handles them. Close this window and click on beyond the basics. 
Here you can read about how to attach files to your documents plus other subjects that may interest you. Now close this window and open your mail drop down menu and choose mail you've sent. We now get a list of mail we've sent. We can read it again, show status, or delete it. Let's do that, Suzanne, to get rid of our letter to Santa. Simply make sure it is highlighted, click the delete button, and it's gone. Now close all the windows back to the welcome screen. Look, we have mail. Click on that button. Remember, we sent Santa's letter to ourselves. To read incoming mail, simply click on it or highlight it and click on the Read button. There's our letter. Let's delete it also since there is no need to keep a copy of it. Select Mail and Mail You've Read This Time. Make sure it is highlighted and click Delete. Go ahead and close the mail windows to get back to our welcome screen. You'll quickly collect your own list of email addresses as you talk with online friends and exchange messages. On the screen now are some other popular email addresses. Happy mailing! By the way, if you're ever just checking places out and get a little lost, you can always return to this welcome screen by pulling down the Go To Menu item and selecting the Welcome menu or go to the channel screen by clicking on the third icon on the menu bar, the channels icon. It's time for us to move on to the next topic, Suzanne, a visit to the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is the fastest growing and most popular segment of the Internet. It utilizes an easy to use graphical interface to display and explore any subject from growing flowers to building jet engines. It is often just called the web for short. Click on the internet button, Suzanne. This opens another screen with a variety of topics to choose from. This allows you to check out the best of or search for things on the web, news groups, gopher, and FTPs. We'll cover news groups in our second lesson on learning the internet and talk about gopher and FTP in our third lesson. There are several ways to enter the web from AOL. You could click on the web icon here or click on the internet connection button. Let's do that, Suzanne. You can also get to this location from the channel screen. Again, we have several choices of places to go on the right side of the screen. There is a lot of information about the internet here and a good place to come back and check out what's being said. We could enter the web by clicking on the World Wide Web graphic, but the easiest way to enter the web, no matter what location you are in, is to click on the globe on the menu bar. Go ahead and do that, Suzanne. Viewers, again, I must emphasize that what you see on your screen will not match what you see here. These opening screens change often, displaying topics of the current times. If the subjects and choices we make are not available when you are viewing this lesson, don't worry. The process we use to move and search for things on the web will not change. And once you understand that, you'll be able to use these tools to find subjects that interest you. AOL's Welcome to the World Wide Web screen offers many options that will take you off into different directions. We are now in the World Wide Web. You can tell because we now have a little box on top of the screen showing the URL or Universal Resource Locator of this homepage, also known simply enough as their web address. In this case, the address of AOL's World Wide Web homepage. By the way, since we are now on the web, this homepage can be brought up no matter what internet provider you are using. If you can access the web, just type this address in your address box and follow along. Before exploring the web, let's take some time to look at some of the components of these web pages. The first is hyperlinks. You've already seen how clicking on buttons, icons, and colored text can take you to different locations. This connection through these different locations is called hypertext links and hypermedia links, also known as hyperlinks. AOL's Welcome to the World Wide Web screen offers many options that will take you off into different directions. Suzanne, move your mouse pointer around the screen and notice how the pointer turns into a hand as it moves over the graphics and colored words. As we've seen, clicking on these graphic symbols or colored words will take you to a new location associated with that link. For example, click on Starting Out. 
we now have another page with more choices. Scroll down a bit and we have topics of how it works, finding your way around, and history. Choosing any of these subjects will take you to other pages with information on that subject or give you more choices pertaining to that subject. For example, click on History. And now we get some more information to read, another list of things to check out. And scrolling down the page, we see a list of documents including a history of the Internet by Bruce Sterling. There's some good reading here that you may want to come back to. Scroll back up the page, click the Welcome to AOL selection, and we return to AOL's home page. Again, hyperlinks allows a user to point and click on words or graphic symbols to move to a new location or file. The unique thing about the hyperlinks you find on the web is that a single click on these items can move you to a different part of this page or a completely different computer site halfway around the world. This shift won't even be noticeable to you except for a small time lag as the screen changes. Will I be charged for long distance when it moves to a website out of my area? No, Suzanne. There is no long distance charge for this move and that is the beauty of the Internet. You are only being charged for your online time through your provider. Again, notice the symbols and text in the little box just above this screen. This box displays the web address for this home page. Each location opens with what's known as a home page. A home page is the starting point for a specific web location, and people are adding new home pages by the minute. You'll find home pages from individuals who may be looking for other people with similar interests to major corporations, governments, even countries. These home pages are accessible to anybody throughout the world who is on the Internet. These web address boxes are automatically filled in to identify the website showing on the screen. These often start with HTTP, colon, slash, slash, followed by www. This stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol on the World Wide Web, followed by the name assigned to the computer. If you knew another web address you wanted to visit, you could type it in this box, press enter, and you would be taken to that address. Each home page may have hyperlinks that take it further down the page you're on to other pages in that site or to other sites around the world. It translates the hypertext links into behind-the-scenes commands so you can easily surf the web. Web surfing or cruising means just following various links out of curiosity. A web surfer uses the hypertext links to move from one location to another just to see where they'll end up. With hyperlinks, web documents are continuously being connected together. Each hyperlink pointer ties one web page to another web page and another with a simple click of the mouse. The process creates an intricate crisscross of resources that might literally look like a spider web weaving together computers from all over the world. Remember, the web is changing daily. Links that you find today may be changed tomorrow, and new links will certainly be added. Believe me, the web is a very dynamic place. Again, viewers, this means that what you see on your computer screen may not be exactly the same as what is on our screens as we proceed through the lesson. One more thing we should understand before moving on is the tools we use to find our way around this gigantic wealth of information. There are two basic programs that help with this task. They are browsers and search tools. Browsers are programs that allow you to look at pages as you follow your hyperlinks through the web choosing different subjects. Search engines allow you to type in keywords for places or subjects that interest you, and they will scour the web looking for locations that contain the words you've typed. That seems simple enough, but what can get complicated is there are several different browser and search programs you can choose from on the web, each with their own functions that make them better for a particular task. Right now we are using AOL's browser. Again, it's the interface that allows you to choose menu items and hypertext links to surf the web. Other popular browsers are Microsoft Explorer and Netscape. Explorer comes with AOL 3.0 for Windows 95, and Netscape comes with other popular Internet providers, as well as a standalone program you can download off the Internet and use with AOL. We cover downloading Netscape in my Level 3 lesson. We're looking at AOL's Welcome to the Web homepage. On the right, we see graphic links to other sites. Scrolling down, we see featured links. These links take you to places AOL thinks have important information for their customers. You may want to come back and visit these sites later. Clicking on any of these blue words will start you on a journey into that subject. On the left, we see some other choices rather than the one we made for starting out. Suzanne, click on AOL NetFind Home.
AOL's Net Find homepage is another page where you can choose from many subjects with an added feature of starting a search. Along the top, we see a place to enter information to start a search. You just type in the words describing what you are looking for and click on Find. We'll do searches a little later. For now, Suzanne, scroll down this page just a bit and we see a variety of topics we can choose from. To demonstrate how to surf the web, let's choose something everyone should have an interest in. How about movies? You can always come back here and check out some of the other choices later. Suzanne, put your little hand over movies and click. Notice AOL has two ways of showing it's working as we wait for our new location's home page. The logo at the top of the screen spins around, and on the bottom of the screen we get a gauge showing us how far along we are in the downloading process. Another thing I should mention here is if you feel something is taking too long to download, or you choose something by mistake, you can click the stop button to cancel that request. We now have entered another page with more choices. This is what you find quite often when choosing subjects. Each choice takes you to another page with more specific choices, allowing you to narrow down what you are interested in. Let's choose the first one on the list, actors. Again, we have several topics to choose from. Scroll down the list a bit and let's see what we have. Notice we have some text that tells us more about what we'll find at each site. The Clint Eastwood site looks promising. Go ahead and click on it. Well, it appears we need a special program to view and hear some of the special effects this site has to offer. This brings up a very important subject about viewing sites on the Internet. New technology is constantly being added to what we see on the web, such as live video and large graphic and sound files. There are many programs that allow you to see these files. However, there is not a standard, so many sites require you to download a specific program to view these areas. This one, the ActiveX Viewer, will allow you to view and hear special effects this site has to offer. You will find other sites need other players to view their special effects. Some of these programs can easily be downloaded while others require you to download, install, and restart your browser for them to work. You may not want to take the time or drive space needed to download these programs. If you don't, you will still be able to view most of the information the site has to offer. On the other hand, a lot of people enjoy using the new technology and don't want to miss anything the site has to offer. As some of these programs become popular, the browsers you use may add these players to their programs, so you will have them automatically. Everything changes quickly on the web. Let's choose no for now. I want to demonstrate that we don't need the player to view this site. Gee, Professor, this might take a long time. Look at how slow it's going. Yes, Suzanne, and that will give us a chance to mention something very important. It will sometimes take several minutes to download a home page, especially if it has lots of graphics. Graphics are one of the neat things about the web. However, the larger the graphic file, the longer it will take to download it to your machine. In some cases, you may be interested in the graphics or you may be interested only in the accompanying information. The web browsers provide you a way to view a home page with the graphic downloading capability turned off. This allows you to move much faster around the web. We'll see how to do this in a second. Okay, we have finally linked to Clint Eastwood's home page. Once the requested page is selected, the home page URL address of our destination is displayed on the top lines of our screen. Viewers, if this choice was not available when you are viewing this lesson, delete everything after the www and type the address manwithnoname.com in the address box. Remember to enter the dashes between the words as you see in the address. Just like email, this cannot have any spaces. When finished, press enter. If this site still exists, you will be taken there. Let's scroll down the page to see what information we have about this site and Mr. Eastwood. At the bottom are several buttons that will take us to other areas on this site. Let's try photographs. Again, we get our message telling us this site contains an embedded file and needs ActiveX to perform the effects. We are not going to download this player for this lesson, so let's select No again. ActiveX may have some importance for this site, but in reality, at this moment, there are other more important players that are used at this site and exist in numerous other sites you visit. So let's learn about them. But first, since we are in the Photographs site, let's look at one. Click on Unforgiven. 
After a small download time, we are given a picture from that movie. Graphics and pictures are a big part of the web, but audio and video are becoming more popular, so let's see how they work. Suzanne, see the button marked back at the top of this window? This will take you back one web page at a time. This button is very useful. Once in a while, you will find yourself following a link that becomes a dead end. Or you might just want to back up a page or two to take a different direction. Press this button twice. And we are back at the Eastwood home page. Scroll down and from the buttons we saw before, choose video clips this time. We are given a page that first explains that we need a special program to play these clips. As I mentioned before, this player called VDO is a popular program used at many other sites. You may or may not wish to download this one. As with ActiveX, you don't need to view everything at a site, but to see this format of live video, you must install it. Since video has a very large amount of information or file size, it's not like seeing a real video on your TV. Because it travels through phone lines, the pictures you see are small and very jittery. Someday soon, I'm sure, technology will improve. I won't go through the steps for installing this program in this lesson. If you wish to install it, simply click on the video icon, Get Alive, and you'll be given directions on what to do. If you do choose to install, there is one thing you should know beforehand. You will have to restart the browser or AOL's Welcome to the Web page for them to take effect. If you do this and want to continue to follow this lesson, you'll have to re-enter everything we've done so far or add this site to your favorite places. If you don't know how to add sites to your favorite places, we will cover that at the end of this section. Now let's check out some options we have with menu items and the row of buttons on the top of the screen. We already mentioned the stop button. When you begin a process and decide that it was a wrong choice or it is taking too long, you simply hit the stop button to abort. Jumping to the left side of these buttons, we see the back button that we used once before. Suzanne, click on this button again until you return to the photographs page. As you can see, this button is useful for quick access to pages you may want to come back to. For example, to check out another picture of Clint. Likewise, the forward button will take you forward. This only works if you've used the back button. Suzanne, click on the Prefs button. This opens a dialog box with many options to control your web interface. Notice the tabs at the top of this box. These open other dialog boxes to enter more instructions. Let's take a quick look at them. The first tab, General, is already active. The first area, Multimedia, allows you to choose what kinds of effects you want active as you surf the web. You can choose to turn pictures, audio, and live video files off or on by checking or unchecking the little boxes next to that item. Turning these off will allow you to access websites quicker as you will only be downloading text. The advantage of this is you don't waste time at pages you really don't want to see, and when you reach a site you do want to see, you simply turn these features back on. Suzanne, deselect all these options for now so we can see how this works when we are finished looking at the prefs area. Next, we can change the colors of our text and background. Click on the box next to Use Windows Colors, and our text colors turn to black. Click once on that, and we get a color palette to choose any color we want. We want to use the default color, so close this box and reselect the Windows option. The next area, Links, works pretty much the same for choosing text colors for displaying sites you've accessed, or the color of the hypertext links. We'll leave the defaults here also, as well as the toolbar settings. Click on Navigation. Here you can select what web page you would like to display when you first enter the web, as well as a favorite search page and quick links to other pages. If you have a favorite site you want to go to, just enter that site's address in this box. It now displays AOL's home page. Let's enter AOL's search page. Suzanne, click just after the M in com, add a forward slash, the word search, and another slash. We'll see how this works a little later in this lesson. At the bottom of this box is history. Suzanne, click on view history. If you go to a site and can't remember where it was, you can always come here and review where you have been to find it again. You can change the number of days you want this function to be active. They will automatically erase after those days. I won't talk about all the rest of these tabs. Some are pretty complicated concepts and others are pretty self-explanatory. There is one more area I would like to show you. Click on the Advanced tab. In the middle of this box, we see Temporary Files. 
As you visit websites, AOLs and other browsers create a place to store web pages, graphics, and other files. In this case, it's the temp directory. Having these files saved allows quicker access to sites you've already visited because the information on that page is already saved and will display quicker. Click on Settings. Notice you can empty your folder of these files right here if you wish. We see a bar we can change that specifies how much disk space you want to delegate to these files. If you are low on disk space, you may want to lower the amount of disk space used. Let's change ours to 2%. Click on View Files. Here is all our temporary files and as you can see there are quite a few built up on our computer. We could go through all of them and figure out which ones we want to keep and delete, but seeing as we have over 1800 of them, it may be time to clear them all out. Also since we changed our disk space setting, we won't get as many of these files in this folder from now on. Suzanne click on edit and select all. Now click on file and delete. There, all those files are gone, and we start fresh adding new ones as we surf the web. OK, Suzanne, click OK and OK again to close the press window. Now, back on the Eastwood Photograph page, choose another picture. Notice we still have text where we can read all about this site, and that the picture is now represented by a small graph that tells us where the picture would go. Now open the press window again and reselect all the options we turned off in multimedia and click OK. Now click the reload button. The photograph page opens. Now reselect Rawhide. Notice the same page loads, but a little slower, and we now see the pictures. I want to mention one other problem with having these functions turned off. Many websites also contain graphic buttons for links to other locations. If you can't see them, you might be missing some obvious choices you won't see with just text. Now click on the Home button. Remember, we entered AOL search address as our home in the prefs window. We are now taken to that page. Suzanne, see the down arrow next to the address box? Click on that. This is another way of looking at the history of sites you visited. The difference between this and the prefs history is this only displays the sites you visited during your current session. When you exit the program, it all goes away. Clicking on any of these will take you back to that address. Click on the manwithnoname.com address. And we are back at that site. Now pull down the go to menu item and choose favorite places. This box allows you to store the web page as an object file so you can quickly go to this location or any location you enter here. We have several locations already stored. Click on Add Favorite Place. This box allows you to enter a title and address to your favorite place, but you must know what that address is. Suzanne, close this window and click on Add Folder. You can add your own folder here. This is good if you have several people using your computer and each person could have their own folder of favorite places. Or you could have folders for different categories of subjects. Click on the close button, Suzanne, to close the folder window and then close the favorite places window. Now click and hold the window option on the menu bar and drag down to select add to favorite places and release. This is an easy way to add a location to your favorite places. Remember to only do this when you are actually in the location you want to keep for quick access. Click on Favorite Places again. Now we see Eastwood listed in our folder. These locations are also easy to delete. Just highlight it and click the Delete button. This is really a handy tool. When you find a page you know you want to revisit, just add it to your favorite places. When you want to go to that page in the future, just open this box. Double click on your choice and you're there. Now close this window. By the way, if you're using another browser, Favorite places are usually referred to as bookmarks. Back to the options on our web page, you see we have a search button. This opens the same AOL Net Find page. Anytime you want, you can enter a search mode by clicking this button. Also remember, you can change this button to open other search pages in the press window. The only thing left here is help. 
You can find help on anything and in just about any place you visit, in AOL or on the Internet. Anytime you see a file marked help or FAQs, that's frequently asked questions, it may be a good thing to look at. Many people have the same problems using the Internet, so you can be pretty sure that someone has already asked the question you are thinking of. One more icon I'd like to point out is the printer. Just click this icon while in the site you'd like to print, and you'll have a hard copy of that page. So far, we've just used hypertext links to surf the web. Now let's see how to use search tools. We could press the back button until we get back to the search page or press the search button. But since we've put it as our home page in the preferences box, just click on the home button, Suzanne. As I mentioned before, search tools, sometimes referred to as search engines, allow you to type in key words or phrases. And the program will scour the web looking for matches to your query. You type these words into this box and click on Find or Search. AOL search page, called NetFind, uses Excite as its search engine. Since the Internet has so many other search engines, let's do a search to see if we can find them. Type Search Engines Guide in the box and click on Find. AOL's NetFind starts searching the Internet. Once loaded, this page displays the first 10 out of over 3 million sites that it found meeting your search words. Notice the 89% mark next to the first site. That is saying this program is 89% sure this is what you are looking for. Scroll down the page and we see other sites suggested by the search program. Notice we get a title of that location, their web address, and a small description of the site. You can check the next 10 sites by clicking on the next 11 to 20 item at the bottom of this window. You could keep doing this until you've checked all 3 million sites. I think it would be a better idea to type in different search words to limit the sites found. Suzanne scrolled back to the top. Let's go back to a browse method and click on the second selection, the searcher, to see what we get. This site may have what we are looking for. It looks like it's dedicated to search engines. Scroll down the page to see what we find. First, we see several different search engines that allow you to type in what you are searching for and use whatever search engine you want. They all work a little differently, so you may want to type in your search criteria into several of them to see what they find. Scroll down a bit. Here we have direct links to the search engine's home pages and a little description of what kind of searches they are best for. Scroll back up and let's try another search engine to see what happens when we search for more search engines. In the Alta Vista box, type Search Engines and click on Submit. Well, this search found about a million sites matching our query. Let's check out the first one on the list. Scrolling down this page, we find icons that are links to several search engine home pages. One of the most popular is Yahoo, so let's select that and see how it works. This takes us to the Yahoo homepage. Are you starting to see how these hypertext links can take you to another page on the same site, or in this case, to a totally different site? Notice we have several areas of interest that we can start choosing on a variety of subjects. But since we are looking at search engines, let's do another search. By the way, if you could not find the same web pages to get to this site, just type yahoo.com in the address box and press enter to join us here. In an earlier internet lesson, we searched for information about NASA's mission to send a probe into Jupiter's atmosphere. Let's see what information we can find on this now. Suzanne, click in the search box and enter NASA and click search. Whoa! It seems we have 1,146 sites found with that search criteria. We could scroll through all of them until we find the one we want, but let's see if we can get better results by being more specific. Click the back button once. Search tools look for matches to words like the finder does in your Windows program. The more description you can enter, the better your chances of finding that information. Suzanne, we know the name of that mission was Galileo, so enter a space after NASA and type Galileo and press the search button again. That's better. We are now told eight sites were found meeting our criteria. 
Remember, if you don't get good results in your searches, to go back and enter more information or try another search engine. Now we are back to a browse method. Suzanne, scroll down the page to see what we have. Now click on Galileo Project Information. Now we have a picture of the probe entering Jupiter. We could print it out if we wished. Scrolling down the page, we can see a lot of information to read about this mission. Physical information, mission overview, science objectives, scientific first of the mission, plus much more. We already know how to explore the menu options on this page, and you may want to come back later. But for now, let's use our search tools to find information that I promised on other service providers. Suzanne, go back to our search screen. And in the search for box, type Internet Service Providers. A space and CompuServe and Prodigy and click on search. Let's see what we can find out about these services. We have one match to our query. Let's choose online connection. Scroll down this page a bit. Well, it seems the information we need is all here. And I might add, put together by a 17-year-old boy named Jay. Suzanne, click on Online Services. Now we have icons of the larger service providers. Clicking on any of their icons will take you to pages that explain everything about their service. You could actually download their software and sign on, right on the spot. Click on Pricing Plans. Scrolling down this page, we find information on each provider's rates, what free hours they offer new users, and what additional hours cost. Suzanne, click the back button. For those of you on the web, you can further explore this page on your own. Find the phone numbers and deals being offered. For those of you who are not online and want additional information, here are the 800 numbers for these services. Click the back button again and choose National ISPs. Now we get a list of more providers. You can look at their features to see what they have to offer in price comparisons with these services. Click back twice to get back to our original search results. This time select business and economy companies. Scrolling down this page we see quite a lot of providers. These are usually just access providers that don't carry a lot of bells and whistles with the program, but do offer one-time monthly charges for Internet access that may be considerably cheaper than the major providers. Some are set up for business use, while others offer you business opportunities if you help sell their services. You could spend a lot of time checking them out. But if Internet access is all you want, this is the place to look. Well, before I let you go, I suppose we ought to figure out how to log off America Online. That should be easy, Professor. Since this is a Windows-based program, can I pull down the File menu and see if there's an Exit command? Sounds reasonable to me, Suzanne. Give it a try. And we are returned to our Windows screen. Well, that brings us to the end of this lesson. Be sure to check out my Level 2 and 3 lessons on Learning the Internet, where we delve further into what the fantastic world of the Internet has to offer. Remember, there's always more you can learn from me, the video professor.